Hello, students. It's Mr. Metcalf here, coming to you live from, well, not live, recorded from my classroom here at Gilbert High School. Uh, I just wanted to share with you guys um, the next module, module 11. Uh, in the first module, um, you all should have looked at Islam and some of the early Islamic empires, as well as Mali and Ghana um, from Africa. So today, uh, we're going to look at Europe in the Middle Ages. Okay, so while great empires were forming in Africa, China, and the Middle East, Europe was still struggling. Okay, uh, the Byzantine Empire was trying to control traditions of Rome or continue, excuse me, traditions of Rome, but with an overlay of Christianity, in other words, focusing on Christianity instead. Okay, and if you look at where Constantinople is located, which we will in a few minutes, it's right smack dab between Christian Europe and Muslim Asia. Okay. To the north, there's three Christian regions that attempt to unify. Um, the Kebian Rus lay the groundwork for an Eastern Christian kingdom, and Charlemagne did the same in the west. In the northern and western reaches of the continent, battles were going on between the seafaring peoples of the Baltic and North Sea coasts. The Danes were extending their reach into Iceland and England and North America even, okay? Which Alfred and England began to unite, okay? so. Uh, there's some questions for you guys to answer, but let's start talking about the Byzantine Empire. Let's take a look at um, a picture of the Byzantine Empire, first of all. So remember, the Byzantine Empire was the eastern half of the Roman Empire. So here's Italy. You can see it, right? It's no longer under the control of Rome or under the control of the Romans. So the Byzantines right here, all through here, and in modern, most of modern day Turkey, okay? This is Constantinople, Constant, <laughs> Constantinople, the capital, okay? This is the Black Sea. So, uh, very, very advantageous spot for the capital of the Byzantine Empire. And as you, as you can see down here, these are Muslim lands, okay? Um, and then there's other kingdoms up here that, uh, that the Byzantines don't control. So between Christian Europe and Muslim, um, Muslim Asia. Okay, so we know about the Byzantine Empire. It, it, it's going to begin with Constantine's conversion to Christianity. Okay, um, he's going to establish freedom of religion under the proclamation of the Edict of Milan allowing anyone to worship whatever religion they would believe. Okay, and this is going to create a pathway for the rise of Christianity, okay, which is important to the Byzantine Empire. Okay. He moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople, okay, which I showed you that position. Um, and it that position, right, that position allows it to control um, tra trade from the Black Sea to the Aegean Sea. All right, particulars. Let's take a look at these. Rulers of the Byzantine Empire, very similar to the Roman Empire. They were absolute monarchs, okay, emperors, okay? Um, they were the commander in chief of the army, they were head of the church and government, and they also managed finances, which is a lot of things for an um, absolute ruler to do and do well, okay? Which is one of the reasons why, and we have checks and balances in the United States, but it's another reason in the United States why we have different branches of government to handle different things, okay? They did consult the Senate. They still have a Senate. However, the Senate was unelected and mostly was military servicemen and wealthy landowners, okay? So it didn't really um, help out the, the normal everyday person, okay? And so unlike the Senate in Rome, which was made up of um, multiple classes of people, or actually, I should say, people from the patrician and plebeian classes um, in Rome, it was mostly the rich and wealthy, okay? Social class, super important in the Byzantine society, okay? It was possible to move up the social ladder. However, not likely. You had to have a good education to do so. Um, Byzantine Empire, they were successful and not successful throughout history. Uh, throughout their history, they gained land, they lost land. Um, so if you look at, uh, if I can select this here and make it bigger for just a second, 
going to mess up all my notes probably. So when the Roman Empire fell, they had the the Eastern Empire was just the orange, okay? Um, and they didn't control any of this. Eventually, they do take some of this in the yellow, all right? But they're going to lose it again. So it's, I mean, it's almost for naught. Let's shrink this back down. Okay. Religion. As I said before, um, Christianity is super important in Byzantine society. The church was led by the Patriarch of Constantinople, who was appointed by the emperor. And remember, the emperor is still the head guy of the church. Okay. Um, Christianity did allow a diverse set of people to coexist peacefully, more or less, in the empire. They weren't, um, you know, because of the Edict of Milan. Um, uh, there were there were times when there were criticisms from the Western from Western Europe um, because of religious differences. Um, there are periods of iconoclasm, which basically uh, reject the idol, idea of idols and, and and wanted their destruction. Okay, so just a definition of iconoclasm for you, right here. Um, a person who destroys religious images or opposes their veneration, right? So even, even like statues of Christ or things like that, or saints or things, um, people are like, why are you worshiping that, right? So there were periods of time where they would um, struggle with that and, and want to destroy it. Um, and that basically, okay, the iconoclasm movement came from the Ten Commandments, right? There's there's the one of the commandments, thou shalt have no idols before me. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they did that. Um, Christian churches were one of the greatest constant contributions um, because of their architecture. Uh, they created, they built one of the most famous churches still around today, the Hagia Sophia. Take a look here. Um, you guys can look at the different you can see, hopefully, maybe, the different images um, of what she looked like. Just a beautiful looking church all the way around, a beautiful complex. Okay. So they did contribute things of that nature. Um, also in regards to religion, the Byzantine Empire was also, Empire was also a major participant in the Holy Crusades. Okay. So... Let me just show you guys a picture of like where the Crusades took place first. And I'm going to show you guys a short video. So here you guys can see, I wish I could, there. Here you guys can see the different Crusades. You have the First Crusade, um, which you had kings from London and France um, and other areas in Europe coming together in the Holy Land. The second uh, mostly originates from over here in Central Europe, with, um, oh, excuse me, the first, sorry, the first is from here and here, and Constantinople. You guys can follow the lines, but you can see they all end up um, in the Holy Land, with the exception of the fourth, which dead ends. Um, they're trying to take back Constantinople. They fail. Okay, so that was where they were located. Let's take a look at a little video. After the ad, of course. This unforgettable vacation memory. It didn't actually begin here. This memory began... Crusades were military campaigns waged by Western European Christians during the Middle Ages for the defense and expansion of Christendom. What made a crusade distinct was that warriors involved in the fighting received spiritual merit, usually a plenary indulgence granted by the Pope. A crusade was considered by Western European Christians to be a holy act, an act of sacrifice and piety for the love of Christ. Four centuries before the beginning of the Crusades, the first Muslim army swept out of Arabia to conquer Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, North Africa, and Spain, some two-thirds of the Christian world. 
Between the 7th and 11th centuries, Christians fought wars against Muslims to prevent them from making further conquests into Christian territory or to reconquer what had already been captured. In Spain, Christian kingdoms waged wars to recapture their homeland from the Arabs, while the Byzantine Empire in the east was engaged in centuries of war with the Muslims for control of Anatolia and other regions. In the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks, recent converts to Islam, swept through Syria and Palestine. In 1071, they defeated the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert, conquering almost all of Anatolia. In response, Pope Urban II called the First Crusade, asking knights from all over Europe to band together and push back the Seljuks. Over the 12th and 13th centuries, the popes called more crusades to the Holy Land and also called for crusades in Spain to help push back the Muslim powers. Crusades against Muslims were not called with the intention of converting them to Christianity. Rather, they were called to regain control of territory that had been previously Christian but had fallen to Muslim armies. Jerusalem had been conquered by the Muslims in 637 and was considered particularly important to Western Christians since it was the site of Christ's crucifixion. Indeed, Jerusalem was revered as the holiest site in the Christian cosmos, and it was particularly important to Western Europeans that it be brought again under Christian rule. When in the 11th century, news arrived that Christian pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem were being harassed and killed by the Seljuk Turks, this fact alone inspired many knights to join the First Crusade. Although the Crusades were called to reclaim lands, greed was not a primary motivation. Professor Jonathan Riley Smith, the world's foremost expert on Crusades history, has proven that crusading was incredibly dangerous and expensive and that virtually none of the knights who went could expect to gain wealth. Indeed, they often bankrupted themselves crusading. The primary motivation for crusading was spiritual, with the knights joining because they believed that they were doing God's work by fighting to protect Christian pilgrims and to reclaim holy sites like Jerusalem, and that involving themselves in a crusade would win them spiritual merit. The crusades to the Holy Land saw many failures but also many successes, the First Crusade and the Third Crusade, for example, were both very successful, though ultimately later, at the close of the 13th century, the last Crusader holdings in Syria and Palestine would be captured by the Muslim Mamluk Empire. However, the Crusades in Spain achieved lasting victory, with the whole of Spain being ultimately recaptured by the Christians. Later Crusades would also be called against the Ottoman Turks, such as the Crusade of Lepanto in 1571. If you want to learn more about the Crusades, subscribe to this channel, Real Crusades History. We present regular videos. Okay, so there's just a little bit of background um, on the Crusades. There's a little more here you guys can check out and read um, about them. Okay, um, so back to the Byzantines. By the mid-13th century, the Byzantine Empire, is their, their economy is collapsing. Uh, that's which I mean, if you don't have a good economy, you're going to eventually start to decline in power. Okay. Um, so they became a lot more reliant on the West, on Western Europe for financial assistance. Um, and eventually they are going to become a vassal state of the Ottoman Turks. Okay. 1543, 1453, the Turks lay siege to Constantinople. And because of their weakness, they weren't able to withstand like they had been before. So they're going to be able to capture the city and usher in a new empire um, after over a thousand years of Byzantine rule. So pretty impressive, but eventually they will fall. All right, let's take a look at the Kevian Rus now. All right, the Kevian Rus. I'll show you guys a picture of their territory in relation. Okay, so down here is Constantinople, right? The Byzantine Empire. You guys can see that. This whole pink territory is pretty much where the Kibian Rus, Rus were. It's kind of the beginnings of Russia, okay? Um, their capital in Kiev, okay? It's really important to note this big river, the, the Dnieper River, which it looks like Dnieper. Um, the Dnieper River, uh, they controlled that. Now, Think to yourselves, what is important about that? Why would that be important? In fact, look at the location of Kiev. It's right on a little lake and the Dnieper River. Okay? 
the importance of that is they controlled um, the major river going through their territory. Um, really one of the, and also parts of the Don River um, and Dniester River, but they controlled those to the point where they can control trade going into the Black Sea over to Constantinople, okay? Making Constantinople one of the most important um, areas that they traded with, okay? All right. So they are the first East Slavic state, okay, uh, located in modern-day Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. And it lasted maybe 300-ish years, okay? Um, Vikings and Scandinavians were wreaking havoc across Europe. Uh, the 18 or the 840s, um, the Vikings were referred to as Varingian, Varingians, excuse me, Varin, Varingians. Uh, and they take control of some Slavic tribes in Eastern Europe that would come to be known as the Kivian Rus. Okay. You get this gentleman named Rurik, um, who is going to take control um, and claim territory of his brothers and establish um, a, a, a capital in a place called Novogard, uh, excuse me, Novgorod, um, and really start to solidify um, who the Rus are going to be. Um, he dies, and it's going to bring about the, the the reign of Prince Oleg of Novgorod. Um, again, I talked about the strategic location on the Dnieper River. Um, one of the rulers, Igor, which is Rurik's, Rurik, <laughs> Rurik's son, and you guys are going to be able to read through this all, but I'm just giving you guys an overview here. He is going to attack... Constantinople. Um, they're not going to be able to defeat him, but um, eventually they are going to um, um, make some really good trade deals with um, the uh, with the Constantinople, or the Byzantine Empire, I should say. Okay, they do have a golden age. Um, basically, I think the golden age. Um, part of that is they 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 call the Christianization of, of their territory. Um, they break off from the church in, in, in the Byzantine Empire and create their own Christian church or their own um, version of Christianity. Um, and uh, they, the, the, the story goes, and you can see the story through here, okay? But the story goes that there was a conversion of the leader, and so the whole country was um, converted. Um, foreign policy, Vladimir was super peaceful, right? He's during, he's, he's very, he's the leader during this golden age, but it's very peaceful with exception of one um, invasion that they have. Um, and they were able to, to, to conquer that. Okay. Um, really their golden age is due in large part to, um, to their relationship with Constantinople. Okay. So then we come to the last great ruler of the Kevian Rus, Yaroslav I, and he ruled for whatever math that is, 1019 to 1054, 40 years maybe, or 20, 34-ish years, 35 years, okay? He um, expanded the Kevian Rus territory, um, but he also focused, after conquering, he focused on foreign policy that was peaceful. Um, he made an alliance with Scandinavia, uh, continued with Byzantines, um, reformed a lot of laws, uh, was able to have a strong enough army to repel um, the Turks from modern-day Turkey. However, as with a lot of kingdoms and things like that that we see, there wasn't a clear successor. And so when Yaroslav died, um, basically the power was split up between his sons uh, and they fought over each other, and they're going to fall apart by the time the Mongols are ready to invade. So now we get to um, Charlemagne. Some call Charlemagne great, um, some don't, but he was uh, in control of the Carolingian Empire. So I'll just give you guys a brief picture of that. Come on. 
so he started out um, in this Western Frankish kingdom, but eventually he controls all of the purple area. Okay. And then he conquers more in this yellow area here. Okay. The green are the papal states. They're controlled by the Pope. Okay. That's what that means. Um, and then after his death, uh, the kingdom is divided into three places or three kingdoms. Um, and they're going to last for a short period of time. And eventually they're going to fall though. Okay. But um, this is a pretty large portion of um, Europe that he controlled. You've got uh, France, part of Spain, um, Germany, the Netherlands, um, all a bunch of little countries over here, part of Italy. Um, I can't remember every single little country that's through here, but Hungary, um, places like that. Um, he was constantly at war with the Saxons. Um, eventually they did become trading partners. Um, I'm going to skip down here to some of the, some of his accomplishments. You guys can read through the other parts. Um, there was, see, so his empire was called the Carolingian empire. Okay. It's hard to say Carolingian. It's weird, but that's, um. That's actually how it's pronounced. So this was the peak of cultural activity under Charlemagne's reign. Now, uh, before I continue, I should explain culture, I suppose. I should have done this at the beginning. Culture, customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social group. In other words, it's what makes a people who they are. Okay? That is... Um, what culture is. So it's very important to understand that. So the Renaissance occurs during about the ninth century or the 800s under Charlemagne's rule as the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, excuse me, which he gets the Pope to crown him. He kind of blackmails him into doing it. Um, there's Europe is going to make some serious agricultural advances during this time. They're going to figure out crop rotation, um, they're going to figure out how to use and build the compound plow, which is going to make things easier. Um, the temperatures are going to rise in Europe a little bit, making growing seasons a little bit want longer. They invent the water mill, which is used to grind grain um, and really helps demonstrate the progression from human labor to technology. Okay, So if you have better food production and easier food production and better land care, you're going to be able to grow as a society. Okay. And it also is going to leave room for people to do different jobs. Kind of like when we talked about an early civilization, right? Once things became easier and, um, and bigger, more people were able to do different jobs. So there's also another, uh, a number of other things that Charlemagne did, um, that were considered great. Um, the Frankish government was a pretty unorganized government. Okay. So what he did was he issued these things called capitularies or documents with laws that he wanted to promote, right? Kind of like, um, um, oh gosh, what are they called? Dog on it. Kind of like when a presidential mandate, right? That, that all the presidents put out. Um, so what he did was he reorganized the government. He reorganized the coinage system to make it more efficient and better, um, he made certain government practices standard, okay? Um, and he kept made sure that government kept written records of everything instead of just kind of throwing stuff together, okay? And then he kept those records, right? He had them stored and, and cataloged and things like that, okay? He also made some serious reforms with monasteries. Um, he figured out that a whole bunch of priests were not literate. They couldn't read, so he basically required priests, after they figured this out, he required priests to learn how to read and, read and write in order to serve in a monastery. Okay, now this is very important because he's going to have these guys making copies of all these ancient texts um, to preserve them. Okay. Uh, he also put a heavy emphasis on education. He ordered the creation of schools and improved the functions of churches, monasteries, and other educational institutions. Um, created a standardized curriculum. Well, he didn't himself, but he had one created. 
Um, the popularization of textbooks really starts during his time period. So you can thank um, Charlemagne for that, although now we've got digital textbooks. Um, the things that they studied included the, tri the trivium, which was grammar, logic, and the quadrivium, which was knowledge like mathematics, music, and astronomy. Okay. He also supported the copying of books. Like I said, one of the things that he wanted the priests and monks and things like that to do was copy everything down. And so they did. They spent a lot of time at their desks copying books. Okay. What this did was it allowed for more people to have access to, um, to literature. The literacy rate, boom, goes up big time because of this. Okay. So, um, like I said, he's going to die, and his kingdom is going to be split into three areas, um, and eventually um, they are going to fall. Okay, so that's Charlemagne in a nutshell. Pretty um, impressive guy. Um, there's all kinds of things we could dig into, because I'm sure he did some untoward things, but um, for the most part, a fairly impressive guy. All right, so now we get to the Vikings, right? Everybody likes to check out who the Vikings were. So let's see where they originated first. Oops, let me close this one. Okay, let me see if I can make this bigger. All right. So this green area, this green area is where they originate. Norway, modern day Sweden, and part of um, Finland. Okay. They had settlements in Ireland, modern day Britain, and Wales, um, parts of um, Russia, over here, which these guys are going to be part of the uh, Kevian Rus. All right. You can see uh, they traded and raided all over the place to include what is now the United States. Okay. Some people think that these are the great sea people that attacked Egypt and the Hittites and people like that, but there's not a ton of evidence connecting the two. So um, that's a little sketchy. All right, so these are Scandinavian people. We show that. They are not a race of people, okay? Viking refers to an activity, okay, which is involving trading, raiding, and exploring, okay? They are depicted as savages. Um, however, that's a lot of propagation. They weren't always scavenger or, or savages, all right? When they weren't out Viking, they were actually really peaceful um, farmers, okay? Well, for the most part, okay? Um, they, there was uh, a group of them that were elite mercenaries called the Varangian Guard, or Ver yeah, Varangian Guard, excuse me, um, mostly because they had no political affiliation, so people would hire them out, okay? Um, they were very good at, at exploiting weaknesses of their neighbors, which allowed them to expand their territory. Um, they really took advantage in England because there was all kinds. So England has always been an interesting area. There were all kinds of different people that lived there from the Anglo Anglos to the Saxons, um, the, all different kinds of Danes, all different groups of people. And so they took advantage of those um, divisions to be able to conquer some territory there. Okay. They had a super strong Navy um, that was very fast. Um, in fact, here's an example of one of their ships and go, here's an example of one of their ships right here. Okay. They're small, they're fast, very maneuverable, one sail. So it, it, uh, it just makes it a lot easier to, to work with. Okay. And like, like it says right here in the text, uh, made it for quick drive by pillages. <laughs> Um, they weren't owned by individual people typically. They were owned by groups of farmers, okay? Um, and kings would assemble these farmers together sometimes and then we'd go out raiding. Um, they expand all over the place. Scotland, Britain, France, Ireland, Iceland, Greenland, but they're not ever an empire. They're, they're, just, they're just a bunch of people, right? The reason when and here, part of the reason why they start going out and pillaging and things like that is because some of their old trade routes dried up. Okay, so they felt they had, in order to expand, they had to pillage under create other countries, and they could create profit that way. Um, 
Leif Erikson, one of the very first um, Europeans to discover America, or the Americas, North America, I should say. Um, they did have a social hierarchy. Now, this part right here is going to be a lot easier to understand, but I wanted to include this um, just in case. And if anybody, if any of you have ever played the game Skyrim, um, they actually use some of these terms in Skyrim. Okay, so at the very top, you had your kings, your earls, okay, and the family of the of the leader. It also included jarls. <laughs> it's pronounced jarls. Okay, they were nobles. Okay, your second group were freemen. They were carls. Okay, landowners, merchants, farmhands, servant women, fishermen, tenants, so on and so forth. Okay, at your very bottom, you had the thralls. Okay, slaves and bondsmen. Then you had outcasts, which were like magicians, witches, sorceresses, shamans, so on and so forth, and outlaws. Obviously, we know what outlaws are. And they were considered a little better than an animal that could be killed without penalty. Okay. Now, just to cover it a little bit, the lowest class are slaves. We already know about that. They had no rights. Middle class farmers who had certain but minimal rights. Um, but they were farmers, and they composed a large majority of the population. The elites were kings and their right-hand men, okay? And they had most of the economic power, owned most of the land, so on and so forth, okay? Women held strong positions and also had many responsibilities. They were very important um, to the Viking people, okay? They were responsible for the farms when their husbands were abroad conquering and exploring. Um, they had way more rights in Scandinavia than anywhere else. The Vikings are very progressive people. Um, when their husbands were home, women held most of the authority on the domestic front, um, not the men. Women were also allowed to own their own property and divorce. More power and freedom than women held in any other civilization. Culturally, they had a ton of culture, right? They had Norse art. So here's just an example of a piece of Norse art that I found. Uh, it's pretty cool. Actually, there's a ton of pictures, but I liked this one. It's just some stone. Um, I'm guessing they carved this out of stone. Um, but they like to adorn things, like decorate everyday objects, okay? And it was made of durable items, not just like stuff that you could just like break real simply. Um, they also had a lot of literature and poetry. I mean, they were writers as well. So not just the things that they made, but also the things that they wrote, okay? Um, and actually, their fine arts were one of the ways that we know what we know about the Vikings. So the end of the Viking Age, though, um, them pillaging and things like that is going to be about the beginning of the Middle Ages. Um, they were so focused on their, exploration, uh, on their explorations that they actually neglected their homeland. Okay. And so that allowed, you know, if you're not at your home, in your homeland, you're totally out there to be influenced by all sorts of other things, especially Christianity. So there's a whole bunch of cultural changes that take place during this time. All right, finally, uh, we're going to talk about Alfred the Great, okay? And this will end out the module. Alfred the Great um, is going to be the first king of England to unify England, okay? England, a bunch of different tribes and groups of people, and he is going to do his best to unify him, okay? His, um, his father was the king of Wessex, uh, and I'll show you guys a picture in a minute, minute here. Um, and Alfred took over after he died and became the king of Wessex. Um, basically, right next to them were the Danes and the Anglo-Saxons, um, constantly fighting, trying to take Alfred's territory. Alfred was pretty smart, though. He really tried to um, use intelligence um, to, um, to win the day, okay? Um, there's some some really cool, like a little legend going on here. So Wessex was going to get captured at one point, um, the territory of Wessex. And I'll show you that picture in a minute. Um, eventually, he, Alfred's going to be able to return and take back Wessex. And he's going to create the Treaty of Wedmore, okay, uh, which he makes with King Guthrum, the leader of the Danish army. Okay. Basically, what happens is this forces Guthrum, who's a Dane uh, and has pagan beliefs to be baptized 
and his army is going to leave Wessex. Okay? And this actually creates a long period of peace between the Saxons and the Danes. So let me just show you this here. This was um, part of where Alfred ruled, the kingdom of Wessex. Okay. Eventually, he is going to control all of this area. Um, he had a lot of social reforms. Okay, he was very keen on the idea of education, especially um, because he couldn't read at an early age, and so he b believed that it was important for children to learn early. Um, he also believed that because he loved English poetry. Okay, so he actually himself, and he himself did this, and, and not just him, but he encouraged it with with other people. But he spent a lot of time translating books from Latin into Anglo-Saxon. Okay. Um, because of that, the literacy rate improved. Um, Alfred's people, their literacy rate increased. Um, and the books that he helped translate, they were primarily focused on history, geography, and philosophy. Okay? Um, his love of knowledge and liberal arts is also going to pave the way for the foundation of schools in England. Okay? Uh, he believed that all freeborn, now you always got to have a little caveat in there, all freeborn English boys should have an education. Okay? So, that led to the creation of a school to educate his sons and other noble boys. Noble boys, right? Not, necess not necessarily everybody. He also created his own legal code for England, okay? And it was really influenced by the Ten Commandments and um, the Book of Exodus, as well as law codes from neighboring kingdoms like Mercia and Kent, okay? He believed that all penalties should be compensated for by a respectable sum of payment, okay, except for treason. Treason was, you couldn't fix that. You died, okay? The penalty was death if you, if you were treasonous, okay? Um, he, he was a very just person, uh, Alfred the Great. He looked at most judgments that were passed under his rule and tried to make sure that all judgments in the future were consistent and fair based on those past rulings. Um, he also developed, and very intelligently, something called a Burgle system. I'll show you what that is here real quick, just with a picture, and then I'll explain it. So all these red dots, they're Burgle, they're Burgs, okay, and what those are are fortified towns where people could go, like your farmers and people that lived outside the town, they could go there in times of attack, right? So that's super important um, for his people, right? You've got a place to go in case the enemy's coming, the, the, the Danes or something. In conclusion, Britain began as a large region with many separate and divided kingdoms but eventually is going to become unified at the end of Alfred's reign and his death in 899. Um, it began when he, con when he conquered or recaptured in London uh, in 866. That's when the unification is going to begin. Okay. And it's going to continue. Um, it's going to continue under his son um, uh, after that. Um, eventually, there's going to be more Danish attacks. There's, the Normans are going to invade. Um, however, really, Alfred is the first person to unify England. So that's one of the reasons why they call him great. Okay, so with this, um, there'll, be, um, there'll be an assignment. Uh, let me just find that here. Um, I'll have you guys answer these questions, which I'll post on Google Classroom here probably tonight or tomorrow. And then um, I think what I'm going to have you guys do, um, even though we're going to be discussing some other things, is work together to um, prepare a debate. I think it'll be fun. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work, but and we'll only have a half an hour to do it. Um, but we'll have a debate. We'll, I'll just pick a couple teams. You guys will have to network together um, over the Internet. Um, and we'll debate who was better, Charlemagne or Alfred, who had more accomplishments. Okay, so I'm kind of excited about that to see where it goes. But um, anyway, that's where we're at right now. Uh, I hope you learned something out of this. Please don't forget to read over the rest of the material. 
um, as I just briefly covered this stuff, even though it's a, like a 40 minute video. Thanks guys.